So we are right now smack dab in the middle of a series on the Ten Commandments. And wow, this is <laughs> a long message and we got short on time. So let me run through here uh, quickly on a little bit of review. The context of the Ten Commandments is oh so important. They are not a list of rules for you to live up to in order to earn God's love. What we have seen over and over, and this is so huge, because this, this is what flips religion on its head. Almost every religion in the world, except for that grace-based Judeo-Christian perspective, almost every religion is work. Do enough things where you earn God's love. You earn salvation. You earn God's attention. You earn God's favor. You earn holiness. You're now approved. And what we see even in the Ten Commandments is that that's not why they're even there. They are way late in the relationship, if you will. They are after God has, by his grace, by his sovereign choice of love and grace, he's chosen a people. He has saved them from slavery. He has forgiven their sins, the whole Passover ceremony. He has passed over their sins. He has not treated them according to their iniquities deserve. He has given them promises for their future in a promised land. He has protected them from evil. He has provided for them in the desert. He has redeemed their life from the pit. He has set them free from slavery. All these phrases we could apply to Jesus in our life, right? Because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that's, God did all of that before any commands. And the commands come as now the response, the love response to this relationship that God has already initiated. And in fact, all of the commandments and the whole law is summarized one chapter later in Deuteronomy 6 when it's the greatest commandment comes and he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. In other words, after everything God has done in our lives and continues to do in relationship, all God wants is our response of love. Love him back. And the commandments are part of that love response so that we stay in his protection, in his provision, and we deepen our relationship with him. And so we've got to see that in all the commands. And this one, this morning, is no different. It's very short. Deuteronomy 5.17, you shall not murder. And so we have to see that within the context of this is ultimately about our love for God. And we move, we're moving now into the rest of these, these, the latter six commandments are what in the New Testament we would say where Jesus said the greatest commandment is love God and love your neighbor as yourself. These last six commandments are how we love God by loving our neighbor or how we show our love for God through the way that we love other people. And so this, this is a heavy hitter right off the bat. You shall not murder. This could go in a lot of different directions. It could be many weeks. But as I was praying, I felt like there's, there's, there's one that stands out that is of critical nature, that is of tragic nature. We do have a global pandemic on our hands. And I'm not talking about COVID at the moment, which tragically has killed 1.8 million people last year worldwide. I'm not talking about AIDS that killed 1.7 million people worldwide. And I'm not talking about the 5 million people worldwide that have died from tobacco and smoke, smoking related diseases. And I'm not talking about cancer that took 8 million lives. More than all of those combined last year in 2020, the number one cause of death on the planet was abortion. Over 42 million lives. 42 million children in the image of God not given the opportunity to live out their God-given purpose and destiny. The leading cause of death in the world. Last year, abortion ended more than 23 times as many lives as the global pandemic of COVID that the world has essentially shut down for all in order to, you know, quote, save as many lives as possible. 23 times more lives were taken through abortion. 
And yet right now in our culture, there's, there's, there's a window that is emerging. Eight states, including most recently Texas, have passed the so-called heartbeat laws, extending protection to human life in the womb from the time of a heartbeat. So, of course, now the national debate is heating up in various ways. There's a possibility of extending protection for the unborn like there hasn't been in decades. And there's the most wild response right now. Uh, it's just There was a, a, an article in yahoo.com that I, I thought it was a joke at first, but it was presented as, by yahoo.com as good news that there is hope to stay the Texas abortion heartbeat law because a group of Satanists have emerged and said that it violates their religious rights in which they do abortions as part of their religious ceremonies. So who are you, Texas, to infringe on our religious rights and tell us we can't do that? And it was like, man, come on, can't you see you're probably on the wrong side of history if your last hope is, are the Satanists? And yet Yahoo is just, hey, good news, we might stop those psychos from protecting babies with a heartbeat. But here we are. So how do we have conversation about this in our culture? I mean, this, this, some of your heartbeats are rapid right now, right? (laughs) We're we're uncomfortable. I'm uncomfortable, so there you go. (laughs) That's probably because I'm in the right place then. So four things today. I want to talk about a word of compassion, a biblical perspective, a cultural talking point, and then a wild curveball from Jesus. He likes to do that. So a word of compassion to anyone who has gotten an abortion or is suffering silently, knowing someone who has or feeling shame and guilt. As a church, we must, must, must have an incredible level of compassion and humility. You look at the the Gospels, you look at Jesus, you look at who he called to be his followers. Mary Magdalene is, is one the story of her is so powerful. A woman known for all kinds of mistakes, all kinds of sexual promiscuity, and, and Jesus loved her, welcomed her, cast out seven demons from her, invited her to be on his inner circle. If that's the case, then grace, forgiveness, and restoration is for all who are in Christ. That is the gospel. Or if you think about that, that man, Saul, who Paul, or excuse me, that who became Paul, that God so loved in a way, but man, this guy was a persecutor of Christians. He was one who literally would break into worship services, drag out Christians and oversee them by their death, or oversee their death. I mean, by really any realistic terms, the guy is a terrorist and a murderer. And yet, Jesus himself appeared to him forgiving him, making him a new man, calling him to repentance, calling him to be an apostle who expands the church and writes more than half of the New Testament. If that's the case, then grace and mercy and restoration is God's heart for all. We all need grace. We all need mercy. We all need restoration. We all need the righteousness of Christ. We have all fallen short and need a savior. Praise be to Jesus. So somehow as a church, that's got to be our posture towards people where, regardless of where they come from or what, what they may have done. When we look into the biblical perspective, and for some this may be review, but it shouldn't get old. When you talk about holy things, sacred things, and we remember those things, which there is calls all over the Bible to remember. Why? Because we forget. And so to review some of these beautiful, sacred realities of how God created the world should feed our spirit anew when we open ourselves up to the Lord. So let's look at Genesis 1, 26 and 28, and just looking at what is God's perspective on life itself. God said... Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. 
God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over every living creature that moves on the ground. Tons of very important things going on in there, but there's a few words that stand out for this purpose this morning. That humanity, I mean, just think about this reality. This is the foundation. Humanity is created by God on purpose by his design in the very image of God himself. And for that reason alone, every life is absolutely sacred and holy. Psalm 139 expands on this in a very uh, beautiful, beautiful way. Verses 13 to 18, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Fear in the sense of like awe and reverence. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Another one that, man, has got so much good stuff in it, but I would encourage you, meditate on that passage. Those five verses can be life-changing. If you can receive that, those words, if you can receive that truth, as God's heart for you, your life will change. It speaks of the absolute glory that each and every human being carries because of where you come from. This passage speaks nothing about the circumstances around conception. This passage speaks to the glory that is happening from God to put you into existence. All life in the womb is under the creative care of God. God is personally knitting each one of us together. I love that word in verse 15, that we are skillfully wrought, woven together. The, the word literally is like skillfully wrought. You have a master craftsman, God, who is skillfully, it's crafting you together. You are God's masterpiece, as Ephesians 2 literally says, the work of an artist. Every single human life is skillfully wrought together by God in the womb to the point where the, the psalmist, the writer, reflects under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and says, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We're made by God, and therefore this my creation, the creation of me, this, this passage is self-centered, but not in an unhealthy way. This is the love of self that Jesus is talking about. Do you know your value before God? If you don't know your healthy value before God, you can't love yourself and you won't be loving others well. It won't be healthy. It will be for the wrong reasons and you won't know how to love God if you haven't first received love from God. And so this is one of those passages where it's uncomfortably about me, about you. It's the writer's talking about himself. And he says, as I ponder these things, I recognize I am fearfully and wonderfully made, meaning I should step back and look at my own life and I should be in awe and wonder of what God has done to create me. Awe and wonder, meaning it was a holy activity. There are no mistakes whatsoever from God's perspective. You, your life is sacred. He even goes on in the, in the end of it to say, how precious to me are your thoughts, O God, how vast is the sum of them. What's wildly interesting, what, what thoughts of God is he talking about? Well, there's another translation that's equally good, that the Hebrew's iffy here, an equally good translation that really captures the essence of when he says your thoughts about me your thoughts God are so vast and they're so precious your thoughts what's the context the context is God's thoughts about him 
And in another translation, the NLT brings this out in an appropriate translation. How precious are your thoughts about me, O oh God? They cannot be numbered. And that is exactly what the context is saying. This passage is all about the writer reflecting in awe of how the, the holy and sacred reality of God knitting him together in his mother's womb, skillfully wrought. It invokes awe and wonder. How precious are your thoughts about me, God? How vast is the number of them? The personal care that God took to create every single life is awe-inspiring. The very existence of one human life should create awe and wonder that God himself dedicated so much thought and effort like the master artist like the craftsman just to bring one life into existence in the womb yet some really dark times ensued in the people of Israel and some forgot their holy design and their destiny and this passage in Leviticus is really a lot of the context of where the murder comes from thou shalt not murder within the Decalogue within the Ten Commandments because there was a cultural reality that was shocking Leviticus 21 to 5 the Lord said to Moses say to the Israelites any Israelite or foreigner residing in Israel who sacrifices any of his own children to Molech will be put to death the members of this community are to stone them I myself will set my face against him and cut him off from his people for by sacrificing his children to Moloch, he has defiled my sanctuary, profaned my holy name. If the members of this community close their eyes when that man sacrifices one of his children to Moloch and if they fail to put him to death, I myself will set my face against the people and will cut them off from their people together with all who follow him in prostituting themselves to Molech. This is one of those few places in the Bible where God's wrathful justice is kindled when life itself has become devalued to the point of sacrificing their own children. God promised justice upon those doing it and upon those who turned their eyes that it was happening. There had become culturally acceptable infanticide. And God came down hard on that because of all of the reasons we've aforementioned about the sacred value of even one human life. And so when we move into our world today in a culturally contextual talking point, it's hard to have these conversations, very hard. But one that goes back to both not only the Judeo-Christian roots of our nation, but as well the, the founders and how they set up into the best of their flawed ability what would be a, a godly society there is a, a, a question that I believe is important that, that can be one for honest robust conversation which is where do humans get value and life from where do humans get rights from where do humans get their value is it God is it government is it parents is it one parent? That cuts right to the heart of the, the, really the whole debate, if you will. Who gets to determine a child's value? Who gets to determine a child's rights? The radical nature of the U.S. Declaration of Independence and the you know, ensuing Constitution was this idea, one of the first founding documents ever in human history that says this, the ethos of the whole thing is the government does not give people rights. God gives people rights, and it's the government's job to preserve, protect, and promote those God-given rights. That's the whole language of the Declaration saying that endowed by their creator certain inalienable rights. That is a God-centered perspective that few founding documents anywhere have ever had. That God is the giver of rights. And that government exists to protect those God-given rights. The government does not give people rights. 
That's how it all, that's most of human history. The king decides the value of human rights. The king decides who has rights, when they have rights, and they change according to the political expediency of the tyrant. The U.S. had a crazy different idea. What if God is the ultimate king? And what if God is the one who gives people rights? And it's not even our job as the government. So that's straight out of the founder's biblical worldview, that Genesis 1 and Psalm 139, that humanity is created in the image of God and therefore life is holy and the right to life is given by God and thus, thus, therefore, the government should exist to protect that right and preserve that right and promote that right. So in the question of where do humans get the right to life, where do humans get value? Is it God? Is it government? Is it a doctor? Is it a parent? Is it two parents? There's a, there's a beautiful story that I read this week that just cuts deep into the humanity that appeals to our humanity so well. It's about a, a young boy named Richard. He's, he's now the world's most premature baby. Uh, that is... Let's see, what is the, he, a Guinness Book of World Record has been set. The most premature baby who was born at 21 weeks and is now alive and thriving. Born 131 days premature, weighed only less than 12 ounces. On his birthday in June 2021, 20, he was declared by the Guinness Book of World Record the most premature, prematurely born baby to survive. So there was all sorts of complications in, in the pregnancy, pregnancy, and the mom had PCOS. Um, she didn't even know she was in labor, and it was obviously just way early. And uh, so they went to the hospital. The doctor said, your baby has a 0% chance of survival. And she said, I was kind of numb being on all the pain meds. I was trying to keep myself in a positive place. 48 hours later, Richard is born less than 12 ounces so I was very scared and nervous I didn't think he was going to make it so small and fragile he stayed in the hospital six months his parents had a journey across the state regularly to see him in the hospital every day for the first month they weren't you know his, his life was literally you know doctor said zero percent chance he had several blood transfusions he was born septic two different ventilators he was fed through an IV for three weeks before transferring to a feeding tube didn't cry till he was four months old. And the mom says once he found his voice, he, he definitely has a voice. Once he started getting milk, he was like, ooh, this stuff's good. And that's when he started turning the corner and getting better. He left the hospital the day before he turned six months old, weighing nine pounds, five ounces, five ounces. Now he's very silly, loves to play, goof around. He does some amazing, let's get to that, that one-year-old picture there. Just celebrated his one-year birthday, cake and ice cream. And, and now he holds a Guinness Book of World Record. So something within that type of story, when you look at the various measures, six months, I mean, the bill for that, I mean, who? I, don't, they, I wish they would have said it, it's probably millions or hundreds of thousands to be in the NICU for six months. But part of what we love hearing about those stories is, is, is really the, the heroic measures that people took. Like, hey, this, this is what doctors are supposed to do. It's supposed to save a life. There's a valuable life here. It's precious. And so they go to all these heroic measures, probably hundreds of thousands of dollars, and they're in the NICU, and you have multiple people dedicated day and night to do anything possible to save one life, to save this baby's life. And you got nurses around the clock, and you got doctors, and you got IVs, and you got feeding tubes, and you got everybody coming in. And, and I mean, it is truly a heroic effort to save one life that was given 0% chance of living. And we look at that and, and our hearts say, yes, that's good. No one says, well, that was a waste of money. That was a waste of time. Doctors should be doing something else. All of us are like, yes, what a, what a miracle. What a victory. What a beautiful thing. Because all of us know deep inside that, that a miracle has taken place. A life was saved. That was given 0% chance to live. Something holy has happened. Something holy has been preserved. 
And that usually has universal appeal. Why? Does Richard have value because his mom said, I want to keep him? You know she was getting pressured to have an abortion. I've heard way, way too many stories of that reality, from, of people who have had difficult pregnancies, children born early with far greater than a 0% chance. She was getting pressured. Oh, even if he survives, the typical line, even if he survives, your life's going to be hard. Well, we wouldn't want our lives to be hard, would we? That would be uncomfortable. So she fought through the pressure that 100% guarantee was there. 0% chance should end this life. But we got to ask that question, does Richard's life have value because the mom said, I don't care what you say, try. Is that what gave his life value? And would his life have less value if the mom had listened to the doctors the pressure that's intense and said, you know what, I, 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 0% chance, that's not a good chance, and you're right, if he survives, life's going to be really hard. I, we, no, you're right, you're right. No, we shouldn't do it. We shouldn't try. That's where we've come. How do humans get value? How do humans have rights? Where did we go so far wrong from a Judeo-Christian worldview that says life is a gift given by God. Humans get their rights from God. There was a tragic Supreme Court ruling in 1992 by Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy who affirmed the Roe versus Wade decision and with this language. At the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence, meaning in the universe, and of the mystery of human life. I know that's hard. I should put, on this, put a quote up there. We're in, we're in like college philosophy right now. But listen to what is saying. Where, let's, I'll read it again with this question in mind. Where does human value come from? Does it come from God? Do human rights come as a gift from God because you're a holy creation of God? Supreme Court now says this. At the heart of liberty or freedom, so he's trying to appeal to good old American values of liberty. So what's real liberty? Real liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning in the universe, and of even the mystery of life. So in either words, how was this lived out as this was an abortion upholding ruling? In other words, at the heart of liberty is the right for the doctors to determine that a child does not have enough value to live. At the heart of liberty is the right for the mother to determine, no, you are not a human life. Karl Marx would be very proud he said that human liberty freedom is when we begin to orbit around ourselves as our own one true son, defining all right and wrong. That is not freedom, that is chaos. If the value of human life is changeable based on present personal preference, we are down a, a road of death and it's already happened. To the point where we, we, we now use extreme measures to make sure at times that babies don't stay alive. State of Virginia has made it legal to have an abortion at full term. A viable human, like if it was outside the womb, this is 20 weeks past Richard, and all the heroic measures kept him alive. We're talking about a full term viable baby outside the womb that now... Listen to what the Virginia governor says. There's a new policy, a new law that says it's okay. The infant would be delivered. The infant would be kept comfortable. Oh, that's nice of you. The infant would be resuscitated if 
That's what the mother and family desired, and then a discussion would ensue between the physicians and the mother. That's culturally acceptable infanticide. A fully human, viable baby. And they have no rights. They have no value. It's going to be 100% determined on the doctor's conversation with the mother. And even if she's way, way out of her mind on pain meds after going through three days of traumatic labor and is essentially high on drugs and not able to make cognizant decisions and is getting pressured by doctors who are getting rich off of this process and the father's not even allowed to be in the room and you are allowed in that moment to determine if a human life has value or not. That's a culturally acceptable infanticide. We must appeal to a higher source of morality that isn't based on the moment, that isn't based on a changing emotional situation or policy of the government. We have to do better. Because what happens when your concept of liberty clashes with my concept of liberty? What happens when the mother's concept of liberty and freedom clashes with a child's concept of liberty or the father's concept of liberty? We have to appeal to a higher source of morality and truth or a rapid decline into chaos is inevitable in all of society. And sadly, we're seeing it. You can understand the origin of something a lot better. Or you can understand the, the nature of something when you, when you understand its origins. And I get so fired up when I hear the origins of abortion in our country. Specifically with Planned Parenthood. Founded by Margaret Sanger. Who was an avowed eugenicist and a racist. And abortion was an attempt at genocide of a people. She said specifically, in birth control and racial embitterment in 1990, 1919, that before eugenicists and others who are laboring for racial betterment can succeed, and by that she means racial betterment, the extermination of the African-American race in the United States. Before eugenicists and others who are laboring for racial betterment can succeed, they must first clear the way for birth control, by which she means abortion. Like the advocates of birth control, the eugenists, for instance, are seeking to assist the race towards the elimination of the unfit. So she is a eugenist, a racist that wants to cleanse the world of inferior races. And she says, hey, we have an opportunity emerging with the whole birth control movement. If we can get them to see our picture, we can use, quote unquote, women's empowerment and birth control to wipe out this race that we see as unfit. She wrote later, later in her book The Negro Project to a letter to Clarence Gable we do not want word to get out that we want to exterminate the Negro population and this is, these are just historical documents when something that is so prevalent now and, and, and is trumpeted as women's empowerment yet it's birthed in such a demonically dark place of literal racial genocide, you might want to question its origins. Or if Satanists are your last hope, you might want to question the nature of your morality. And I know we're kind of over right now here, so <laughs> uh, I apologize. I want to finish with two quick things. One is we have got to share stories of redemption. Ryan Baumbarger founded the Radiance Foundation, 
I would encourage you to look it up, Radiance Foundation. He has a simple letter to our president that he leaves pinned on the top of his Facebook page which says this, Joe, dear Joe, I was conceived in rape but adopted in love. Do I have less of a right to live than you? Every human life, regardless of circumstance, has inherent and equal value. President Joe Biden, I pray your heart awakens to this simple truth. Signed, Ryan Baumberger, an adoptee and adoptive father. And he hashtag, I am the 1%. And he goes on to say, we believe all are created with God's given purpose, planned, unplanned, able, disabled. Every human life has God given purpose. I am the 1% used to justify 100% of abortions. My biological mother was raped, yet she rejected the violence of abortion. I was adopted and loved. Instead, I am not the, quote, residue of the rapist, as Senator Vivian Davis says, those who like me are. I am the resilience of my birth mom. And the only father I've ever known is Henry Bomberger, a man who could have lived a normal life. Instead, he chose to live an extraordinary one as he stepped up to live those that other men had abandoned. I couldn't control the circumstances of my conception. Could you, Senator? My birth mom needed an active healer in her life, not an activist huckster. As an adoptee who grew up and want, as, a, as an adoptee who grew up wanted and loved in a multiracial family of 15, and now as a happily married adopter, uh, adoptive father with four children, I'm here to say there is another side to this painful issue. The other side is God's redemptive power, even in the darkest of situations. For more on Ryan's incredible life story, and this is a group I would encourage you to support, the radiancefoundation.org, doing some incredible work. Lastly, a curveball from Jesus. And I apologize, we're going long today. But how do we now posture our hearts? This, the, the, here's the challenge. What's my heart condition towards those who even perpetuate or perpetrate abortion? What's my heart condition? How's my heart doing towards the doctors, the lawmakers, the policy makers? Whew. Jesus says this in Matthew 5. You have heard our ancestors were told you must not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. So there's Deuteronomy 5. There's the Ten Commandments. So we're like, all oh, right, yeah, that commandment. Jesus upholds that, which he does. And like everything, he also takes it to a whole nother level. But I say, if you are even angry with someone, you're subject to judgment. Subject to judgment if you murder. Subject to judgment if you're angry. If you call someone an idiot, you're in danger of being brought before the court. If you curse someone, you're in danger of the fires of hell. Man, that wasn't even in the commandment about murder. Jesus is literally talking about the same commandment. And then he says, now here's the updated commandment for my followers. That's going to take you even deeper with God. But don't worry, you got the Holy Spirit to do in you what you can't do on your own. Whereas murder is awful, and it still is, so is anger, so is cursing someone, so is hate. The new way of the kingdom of God is that in the same seriousness before that you took murder, now you are to take anger. Make it that serious before God, because it is to God. You're coming from the same place. So the apostle John, who heard Jesus preach and lived with him and watched Jesus live this out to the unlovable, to those who didn't deserve it, to those on the cross who said, Father, forgive them. John applies this verse to his own church in John 1, 1 John 3, I mean, he says this, verse 14, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Man. <laughs> so this brings the challenge to the followers of Christ. How do we while still speaking truth and standing up for righteousness, love and not hate, bless and not curse, so peace, not anger, towards even those who are defying God's heart and promoting a culture of death. 
only by the Spirit of God. This is the new way of the kingdom. Overcome evil with good. Help me, Jesus. Let's pray. Dance like day.